Now, the cadre's assessment of leaders is arguably the most critical component that they look at. Above your ability to run fast and do push-ups and your psychological profile, all those things matter. But the cadre are charged, because it's subjective, they are charged with analyzing leadership capacity within candidates and their ability to work as a team and support a leader. All right, in this episode of The Team Room, we are going to talk about selection. Special Forces Assessment and Selection, more commonly referred to simply as Selection or SFAS. I can still remember being in basic training down at Fort Benning. And this was as a 24-year-old man. Graduated college, had a lot of life experience, and still with selection looming overhead, it was daunting. I was, I was nervous about it. There was a book that was written in 2005 by some Special Forces Lieutenant Colonel. The title of the book is Get Selected. And that was the Bible in terms of preparation. And somehow someone in my basic training class got a hold of it and myself and the other 18 x-rays drooled over this thing like it was gospel all right 18 x-ray is the mos associated with being a special forces recruit which is what i was meaning that i came into the army on a special forces contract so assuming i would be successful I would bypass spending any time in the conventional army, which is ultimately what ended up happening. We got a hold of Get Selected, and we just took turns passing this thing around in our downtime. And it's a book I'd recommend. I think there's, there's certainly some value in there, uh, particularly for someone coming straight off the street, uh, particularly for a younger demographic, someone who's you know, 19, 20 years old. Uh, there's some good material in there. You know, there's some stuff in there that, that at the time was the most important thing I'd ever learned. For example, techniques to lace up your boots, like different ways to actually just tie your boots is, is in the book, Get Selected. Um, some knot tying is in there. And some other things that, you know, certainly have some value but at the time of me reading it, this was the most important literature I had ever consumed. And really, by reading that book, it just it increased my level of confidence a little bit. That's really what it did. Some of the things I learned in there, I was able to extract and maintain and employ during selection, um, but it really didn't prepare me all that well for what I actually had to do once I got there, or I should say, the things I learned in that moment, I didn't successfully employ them in selection. And that was a, a, a big part of me being successful. But it did increase my confidence by having that knowledge prior. And that really is what I am looking to get after here with you right now over the next few minutes. <clears throat> This is a topic I'm sure we'll talk in greater detail on. So this is somewhat wave tops for now. But to get the ball rolling with those of you out there that have aspirations of becoming a Green Beret, these are some things that you can take and put in your toolkit and employ during your train up. But more importantly, it's to, it's to enable a higher degree of confidence within you now, because that is really what you will likely take away from this and will lead to a greater likelihood of success down at Camel Call, Fort Bragg, when you go to selection. The keys to success 
for selection is really fourfold, in my opinion, from a, from a big picture perspective. The first is physical fitness and physical readiness, physical preparedness, okay? I think this is pretty obvious, but I'll touch on some, some specifics. The first is rucking. Rucking is a, I guess, a military term for putting a heavy backpack on and walking or moving with it for a long period of time. That's what rucking is. You will have a rucksack on your back most of the time in selection. And this thing will become a tick that is just trying to suck the life out of you over the course of what is today a 21 day journey <laughs> that you will be on. You're gonna have a rucksack on most of the time. So in terms of your physical readiness, training with a ruck and training on rucking specifically is extremely important. Just getting comfortable with having that weight on your body and moving with it. In addition to that, what comes with rucking is foot hygiene or foot health. And this is more than just taking a bar of soap and cleaning the dirt off your foot. I'm talking about maintaining the status of your feet so they're in working condition. This is something that I'm, I believe is in the book Get Selected that I read during basic training and I completely ignored it and it almost cost me being selected. It's a story that I'll tell at a later time. <clears throat> Taking care of your feet goes hand in hand with rucking. Putting those miles on your feet. It's gonna break down the tissue, it's gonna break down the skin, which is essentially what you want to happen during training to build up that durability within your feet, within your feet itself, within the tissue itself. Yes, we're gonna increase the strength or within the muscles around our ankles and our knees and our hips, which is important as well. I'm also talking about specifically the condition of your actual feet. Blistering is going to happen, okay? So learning in training how to recognize an oncoming problem with your foot, something like a blister, to slow down or prevent or mitigate or stop that from getting worse, and then also once it gets to be a problem, once there is a blister, the skin's broken open, training on how to keep your feet in working condition despite having that problem. I cannot overstate this enough. In addition to that, when it comes to physical fitness, yeah, you know, you're gonna be tested physically on a lot of different things. Uh, just focus on body weight movements in terms of your evaluations. Running, push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, right? Those are the areas in which you will be tested physically. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's all you do in terms of your preparation, but the only way, or I should say, the best way to get better at doing something is to do that thing. So if you are doing a whole bunch of flat bench press work to increase how many push-ups you can do in two minutes, you're missing the mark, right? You need to do the thing to be better at the thing, right? The goal is to go into selection with the ability to max an Army Physical Fitness Test, APFT, which today anyway is still the physical fitness test that's given down there, be able to max that without even thinking about it. Because chances are, when you are forced to execute on that test during selection, you are not gonna be in optimal performance condition. It's probably gonna be at night, after maybe just a couple hours of sleep, running down a dirt trail that you can't see. So go into that knowing that you will likely perform worse than you would leading up to going to selection. Therefore, by being able to max that thing without even thinking about it, it's gonna increase your confidence, it's gonna decrease your stress as you're leading up to that event in selection. And that level of stress management and your ability to stay calm is extraordinarily important because selection overall is a marathon. And that stress and those stressors, they add up. 
they compound over time. So the more opportunities we have to prepare in advance to mitigate stress increases, the better we're gonna be overall during the marathon that is SFAS, okay? And then lastly, when it comes to PT, you know, selection is a marathon with, with a bunch of different sprints built within it. So you're going to want to prioritize durability. Durability meaning longevity, meaning your range of motion, your flexibility, right? Like having a deliberate focus on these methods of training and the results of those training is going to harden your overall machine to make you less prone to injury. So to become more durable. That's physical training or physical readiness. The second pillar is mindset or mentality, okay? And this is actually quite simple. Yes, this is something you can train on without question, but just hone in on this. Why are you here? This is the question you are going to ask yourself during selection when it starts to suck. Why am I here? Why am I putting myself through this voluntarily? When the pain and the discomfort and all that comes in, which you know is happening, the answer to that question is what is going to enable you to continue moving forward through that pain and stress and discomfort and heat and hunger and thirst. That is how you will do it. So in my opinion, there's no wrong answer to this. There's no wrong answer to this. What you need to do is just be very honest with yourself about what that is. Now, now I'm not saying what you tell your friends, what you tell your family, what you post on Instagram, right? If you truly are going because you are a through and through patriot, and you want to serve this nation at the tip of the spear, then great, that's the answer to your question. If you're going to selection because you just want to do something that's really hard, because you want to find out where your mental or physical limitations may be, kind of like the David Goggins approach, then that's also fine. But just know what that is. Be very honest with yourself about what that is, because again, you're going to ask yourself the question, when it sucks, why am I here? And you're gonna want that answer readily available and clearly defined and refined to a point where you can see it crystal clear. That's what's gonna get you through the times that, that are really, really challenging down there. The third pillar to success and selection is leadership coupled with operating on a team. Now, the cadre's assessment of leaders is arguably the most critical component that they look at. Above your ability to run fast and do push-ups and your psychological profile, all those things matter. But the cadre are charged, because it's subjective, they are charged with analyzing leadership capacity within candidates and their ability to work as a team and support a leader. Those are two different things. Okay, in selection, everyone is gonna get an opportunity to be a leader and, and lead an element to conduct a task that is essentially impossible to complete successfully. You're gonna be given task, condition, standards that are going to be quite overwhelming. The point behind these exercises is not to see if an element is able to successfully move from point A to point B, literally or figuratively, within the allotted standard. It really is about how does that team function as a team? How does that leader lead that element? That is what is being evaluated. Leadership is very much a skill. It is very much a skill, just like shooting free throws. The way you get better at shooting free throws is by shooting a lot of free throws. It's by training, okay? So if you are not deliberately training on leadership now, I would advise that you begin that, that, that quest as soon as possible. Begin absorbing that information and then begin 
applying it practically throughout your day-to-day -day life. Lastly, and this is a little more technical, is land navigation. Land navigation or land nav, it gets a lot of guys because it's both a combination of physical capability and a technical understanding of what land navigation is. And when I say land nav, I'm talking about one's ability to move cross country, meaning without the use of roads or trails, move cross country from location to location to location within thick vegetation at night by yourself with nothing more than a map, a compass, and a protractor to navigate, okay? Yes, this is difficult to, to train on if you don't have those resources readily available. You can accomplish quite a bit through manuals, YouTube, Google searching, right? Just understanding the foundational principles of land navigation, what they mean, how to train associate. Uh, if you can just score yourself a map of any given area that you have access to, and just spending time out in that terrain where you're able to figure out where you are on a map and then look up around you and be able to connect those dots to what you see on a map versus what you see in three-dimensional time and space. The, the more reps you can get at doing that, which you can do anywhere, as long as all you need is a map, the more reps you can get at that, the more proficient you will become. There are options out there across the country where people have private land navigation courses. And yes, it co it's an investment. It's gonna cost you time and money and energy to go do this, but those are options that exist. These are options that I knew nothing about prior to, but there are plenty of people out there, private landowners, that a lot of which are veterans that own hundreds of acres and they've just set up different stakes with different markings on them to show what grid coordinates is there. And for what you would be surprised is a relatively low fee. They will let you come out there and just run around on their property to practice land navigation. A lot of them actually, the, the accommodations are actually quite amazing because this is their way of giving back to the military community where they've got bunkhouses, chow, uh, drinks, even some recreational stuff, four wheelers, archery, shooting, right? So you can determine if this is an option for you, but I merely want to pass that these options do exist, right? We'll get more into selection here within the team room in future episodes. For now, to get the ball rolling with those of you that have set becoming a Green Beret within your sights, PT, physical readiness, mindset, leadership and team dynamic, and land navigation. If you invest time and energy into training on those things now, you will destroy selection. And that's the goal, is to go in there on day one with that level of confidence that you are going to succeed.